Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Berta Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. As a business and healthcare law firm, we are sometimes triggered by certain buzzwords our clients will say in conversation. Yep. We know that there is a potential disaster when we hear these words and are immediately on high alert. This season's theme is red flags. Well, Michael, before we get to today's show, those watching us on the video platforms like YouTube may have noticed that it looks like we're in our new podcast room. Actually, believe it or not, this is the same room that we've been recording all our episodes to date, but thanks to our awesome team led by Riley, who's off camera, um, uh, they have really gussied up our podcast room for uh, audio and video recording. And hopefully, those listening to us on the audio um, on the podcast platform, you'll have a chance to stop by our YouTube page and see how good the room looks, and then be reminded why we have faces for radio. Yeah, maybe next season hair makeup, Brad. <laughs> maybe. Um, well, I um, ding. <laughs> Michael, um, not everyone listened to the first episode. Do you want to tell the audience what you just did? Yeah, I was paying you back for episode one. All right. Tell the audience why you just dinged me. Oh, this season we're allowed to say ding when we hear a red flag. You said I, and I instinctively said ding. My bad. I forgot um, what I was about to say. Uh, um, no worries. Okay. What we have to do, and we talked about this off air before, is we have to share our recent experience of flying on a private jet. Michael, what is the opposite of ding? I know. I mean, this is not normal life in Bertadotto, no. and we got to see a different lifestyle for a few hours. Yeah, I had to admit, um, if I could just, I could really get used to flying private. Uh, it felt like we were imposters who accidentally uh, stepped into some alternative world. Yeah, and we, we probably need to clarify, we did not do anything illegal no. to get on this private jet. No. We were actually invited, and we were invited by a very generous friend to go on a quick uh, getaway trip. Yeah, true. Do you think everyone who saw us boarding or getting off that plane that day, they turned their friend when they saw us and said, ding? I do recall you having a Saint shirt on, and so you were definitely <laughs> a red flag. You were a walking red flag. <laughs> I feel like we should, however, share with the audience some important lessons we learned about the private jet world, because I know... Uh, it was very eye opening, and we uh, we have some different kind of wisdom. We, that we do, have now. yeah, yeah. So number one, I'll go uh, first. Um, it's cool. You don't go through security. You actually get in your car and you drive right up to the plane and unload from the from your car directly into the plane or right up to against it in the hangar. It's pretty amazing, and thankfully, and somewhat surprisingly, we did not run into the plane with our car when we were dropping off our luggage. That seems like something that we would do. Yeah. And we didn't. Yeah. Number two, the real cost to having a private jet is not the actual buying of said plane, but the annual operating costs like fuel and maintenance, ding, pilot. Ding. It's a, what? You make it sound like the cost of a plane is actually aff – and actually it's affordable to most humans. Uh, that is not exactly like going out and buying a whole set of new razors that cost a dollar uh, and then you go broke in all the re replacement uh, blades. Well, actually it is kind of like that, Brad, except in the case of a private jet, we can't afford the razor or the blades. True, true. All right, number three, I learned what it means to be F.U. rich. Well, that – Sounds like a, a term of art, but maybe it's instinctively and people don't need a vocabulary definition of what F.U. rich is. But I would think the audience is thinking that owning a private jet in of itself qualifies you as being F.U. Oh, rich. Oh, no, 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 Michael. That's just being wealthy. There's a different – that's a lower level of being wealthy. Most private jets require you to crouch when you board because you can't stand. Now, luckily for someone like me who is tall for a hobbit, I don't really have to crouch as much as someone like you. Um, but if you can stand up on your plane upright, you're F.U. rich. I, I, I still don't, can't wrap my arms around that one. So we'll hey, move to number hey, this, four. And this is not Michael and I. This is 
the, the people that we spoke with explained to us the world of jets. Yes. Private jets. Number four, Brad. Go to the bathroom before you board. Yep. Private jet, or at least the non-FU rich private jets, yes. do not have an easy to use bathroom option on board. I think technically there's a toilet that can be used under one of the seats and maybe even a curtain you can kind of pull to give you some level of privacy. But don't be fooled. The person is still just a mere inches away from you. You cannot be shy if you go this route because you are there with the entire plane. True. So number five, and this will be our last one to wrap up, private jets have amazing snacks on them. Ding. What did I do? Those animal cookies you helped yourself to was the stash for the four-year-old son of our host. First off, let me uh, rebut that. Number one, animal cookies are awesome, and he said to help ourselves. And secondly, I get a little cranky, you know, if I need a snack. So I think that was uh, – and and I did leave a bag for that four-year-old. Well, I may have eaten that bag, Brad. Ding? I don't think you're allowed to ding yourself, Michael. Well – I doubt we're getting invited back anytime soon, so I hope everyone learned all that we could lean, learn to about teaching you about private jets. Uh, in fact, for those listening to us on this podcast, please go to our YouTube channel, and you get to see a picture of us standing in front of this private plane with our friend. And in this picture, you'll see a very cool private jet and that it was crazy windy that day. You'll also note the awesome beard I was sporting that day. But Michael, what does private jet talk have to do with our show today? I'm glad you asked. As part of our client's story today, the the story centers around the fact that he is successful, not F.U. Rich successful, but successful enough to have a private plane that he runs through his dental practice. Ding. What red flag did you spot? All right. Running the plane through the business for context, that's a layman's way of saying that he deducts the expenses for operating his plane as a business expense of his practice, um, so practices profits and loss statement. I hit the red flag button because whenever we hear about quasi-personal – and I'm, can I use personal? I'm using air quotes for the listeners. Um, personal expenses being run as a business expense, we know that there can be issues with this. We see it in expensive cars that will be ding, run through, ding, country club memberships, ding, artwork. Ding, ding, ding. This is not – in itself wrong. I'm dinging this for a reason. But we're spotting the red flags part of this uh, season, and the clients usually works with their CPA on the deductible issues from the IRS, um, from, from an IRS perspective. We see trouble on the business side, particularly when um, partners are involved in these uh, ownership. Exactly. So today, Brad, let's call our client Dr. Pig. Ding! Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so, you you said dentists and you said airplane. What 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 does that have to do with Doctor Pig? Well, I like to keep things fresh, Brad. Okay, you know this is not our first season. We got to keep keep you on your toes here. So go with me on this, and I'll explain why we're calling him Doctor Pig later in the episode. All right, I'll allow it for now. Let's keep going. Well, Doctor Pig actually reached out to me because he wanted to sell a small portion of his dental practice. To a star employed dentist. Very common. We see that kind of uh, all the time. Dr. Pig wanted to spend more time with family. Let's call his associate Dr. Fake. Ding. Uh, you're kind of out of control today. Hey. Hey, man. We're, we're having fun here. Mm. So let's dial it down. We're okay. Dr. Fake is not a reflection of his personality or his teeth. I'm going to give you a very short lease here, Michael. Okay. Well... Thanks, Judge Brad. That's right. Let's continue. Dr. Pig and Dr. Fake have worked together for eight years and are close friends. They even share the same CPA, which was theoretically going to make this a smooth transaction. Yeah, that's pretty common too. So what were the terms of the sale? Dr. Fake would buy $700,000 of stock from Dr. Pig in return for – 15% of the company. We had a whiteboard meeting. In fact, we had multiple whiteboard meetings to build out the structure. Very cool. The CPA was not on these whiteboard meetings. Ding. Yeah, it was a good use of the button, Brad. Thank you. The practice didn't want to bring the CPA on because they had already, quote, worked through those issues, and they had 
uh, had an agreed value already. They had agreed to this 15% per- percentage to be sold. And so – Pause. Was the airplane an issue? Great question. Yes. We we're going to give you an animal cookie. Yeah. We were going to have each of the owners be entities that own the practice entity. So let's let me dial it back for context. I know everyone likes that mm-hmm. likes to have context, or right. at least I do. You do, yeah. So for, I'll I'll please myself there you go. with explaining this. The dental practice was a professional corporation, and when this person, Doctor Fake, was going to buy in, the the way to navigate having Doctor um, Fake not navigate around the airplane issue was going to be to form two professional entities, one for Dr. Pig and one for Dr. Fake, so that um, that these two entities would own the practice entity and then the airplane could still be run through Dr. Pig's entity and Dr. Fake wouldn't be impacted. Yeah, that's a pretty – it's a great solution. Uh, we also refer to the quasi-personal expenses and direct expenses a lot of times. Uh, their, their, their expenses attribute to one another. Well, this was all great until we received an email from the CPA that he wanted to have a conversation about the structure. Ding. Ding, ding. Hmm. He shared two pieces of news that changed everything. First, he told us that the practice entity was actually an S corporation Ding. instead of a C corporation. Ding. Um, this is a legitimate issue to the model, Michael. Yes, our client had insisted not in the first whiteboard, but in the first whiteboard and the second whiteboard that the practice entity was a C corporation, and uh, and for sure uh, it's a it's a legitimate issue, and it's something we should talk a little bit about when we come back from commercial on the uh, on the analysis side, but I don't want to distract too much from the second piece of news. Should I just have the red flag ready to be thrown or my ding button? Yeah, just, you just get it out there. You'd be correct to do so. Dr. Fake is so named because he was going to have the chance via the suggestion of the CPA to buy some phantom stock. Ding. Um, let's pause here again. We hear the use of phantom stock or phantom equity all the time. And you should just pause. Um, and I think, Michael, this is our, our first vocabulary word of the ta- day, except for – F you, Rich. But um, <laughs> phantom stock is a term of art used to pay someone like an owner even though they don't have actual ownership, actual stock or or shares in the entity. Um, we use that sometimes as a bonus compensation agreements that would pay a key employee a bonus based on the profits of a sale or potential distributions or other things of that sort. The key is that it is bonus compensation that actually is designed in a way to mirror ownership. If a distribution is made to the owners, then a phantom equity owner will get a bonus for a similar amount. All right. Yes. So now that we understand what phantom uh, stock or equity means, so what was the problem here? Well, remember, our client was planning to sell and had a, an agreement already before he even got to whiteboard number one with us to sell actual equity, 15% of his practice, for $700,000. Mm-hmm. You don't typically sell phantom equity because it's it's fake. It's it's a it's a bonus agreement designed to mimic ownership of equity. It's just a contract for a bonus. And so I explained to the CPA that yeah, we could do a phantom stock agreement. We've done them plenty of times, but we would need to check with the client because the client had an expectation of getting a seven hundred thousand dollar check in return for selling ownership. Yeah, that's definitely a shift in the overall uh, sale issue. So how did Dr. Pig react to the phantom stock idea? Well, we didn't – I don't know if this is good or bad, Brad. We didn't have to actually go to Dr. Pig because the CPA – and again, I don't know exactly how to call it. This is the best or worst part of it. The CPA said that he still wanted Dr. Fake to write a $700,000 check. Ding. And for Dr. Pig to still realize a long-term capital gain from that sale. Uh, But Dr. Fake would just have to have it be phantom equity instead of real equity. (laughs) (laughs) Ding again, audience. Um, Or perhaps I should be saying WTF (laughs) since uh, that seems to be something we uh, 
I sense I'm not cursing. Um, maybe we should call the CPA the phantom menace as this proposed model is extremely problematic. Ding to you for bringing <laughs> Star Wars in so early this season. I know, though, I, it, you are not incorrect. I am thinking, how in the world do you sell nothing for $700,000 and get a capital gain? Yeah, and that's the very point of a long-term capital gain is the sale of stock. I know. I know. It was it was like the CPA wanted to solve all the problems by having a stock sale and then just magically labeling it a phantom stock. That sale. reminds me, Michael, that old expression comes to mind, put lipstick on a pig. And there you have it, Brad. Uh... That's why we call him Dr. Pig. All right, my mind's spinning a little bit. Let's go to commercial and on the other side, talk more about phantom equity from a legal perspective and why we hit the ding button so many times in this first part of the episode. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123 to the Bird Auto. I'm your host, Brad Auto, with my co host, Michael Berg. Now, Michael, this theme is red flags. We've had a lot to unpack here in this first half of the show. We had two primary legal issues that we want to discuss and the impact of, of the practice, any, the dental practice being an S Corp, and then the CPA's desire to call it Phantom Stock. Let's start by resettling a little. What was the CPA's goal? with calling it phantom stock. So the problem he was trying to solve was worth solving. Mm -hmm. He was concerned about Dr. Pig being able to deduct his plan expenses and other similar type expenses without having to answer to Dr. Fake. He didn't want Dr. Fake to have, uh, to be impacted negatively by these deductions. Mm -hmm. And um, so if Dr. P Fake paid 700000 to own equity in this company, Dr. Fake would have a voice in those type of expenditures. Yeah. And so the CPA figured that we could basically just do the deal in a way that took away Dr. Fake's voice. He thought phantom equity was the route to go. Yeah, and because phantom equity is a term of art, it, it, it does unfortunately get mis misused, which is – you know, um, it's not like um, it's not a magic solution that fixes everything, which is why often when we hear that term being used. We hit the ding button um, because we want to make sure, again, that it's prop being properly applied to whatever the situation is. Yeah, and and exactly. And as we discussed earlier, phantom equity is really just a compensation arrangement. Yeah. There are no elements of equity when a phantom equity holder is paid. It's characterized for IRS purposes as a W-2 payment or possibly a 1099 independent contractor payment. Yeah. So why is it why is this so important for our audience to understand? Well, so a distribution made to an owner is characterized differently. It shows up in the case of an S Corp on their K-1. Mm -hmm. This is actually why the term of art is phantom equity. It's fake equity. Yeah, and this is why it was ridiculous to suggest that someone pay – $700,000 in return, they essentially get a contract you paid a bonus. And it was impossible uh, to have the 700000 payment be characterized as long-term gain since the long-term capital gain relates to actual, not phantom, actual real equity. Yeah, and there's a sister company, a sister company, sister concept yeah. we talk about in business arrangements every once in a while where an individual will hold what's called a profits interest in a company. Yeah, and Michael, thinking through this entire plan, could that have worked in this situation? Theoretically, yes, with a couple of caveats. An S-corporation cannot grant a profit's interest to someone or it will blow the S-election. Yep. So I'm sure the CPA did not want to go the route of a profit's interest because he did not want to impact Dr. Pig's ability to deduct the airplane expenses. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the whole reason we're having this exercise is so 
he could continue to make these deductions. Yeah. There are some alternative models that theoretically could have been explored, but we would arrive at another problem. A profit's interest would not be worth $700,000. All right. So tell our audience, what do you mean by that? Okay. I'm going to take us back to law school for a minute. Woohoo! And, and did you ever learn about the bundle of sticks in law school? Yeah. Okay. Well, we learned about this in, in when we were learning about real estate, just this idea that if you uh, fully own a piece of real estate, they call it fee simple, Brad, yes. if you remember, then you have the entire bundle of sticks. Yes, you do. If you grant or someone has some smaller interest in real estate, so an easement to the property, that is not, that's a couple of the sticks from the bundle, but obviously not the full bundle. Yep. So if you own the property and then you grant an easement, then you have, you know, not the full bundle. You have the, the full bundle less the sticks that would represent the easement. Same thing for leasing a piece of property. Uh, that's a different, you know, few s- stick that would go away from your bundle. Okay, so how does stick talk have to do with applying it to a business ownership situation? So if we use this kind of principle as an illustration, and Doctor Pig owns one hundred percent of his business, mm-hmm. he has the whole bundle of sticks. He does. So if he sold as the original plan, if he sold Doctor Fake. of the company for $700,000, Dr. Mm -hmm. Fake would now own 15% of the bundle of sticks. Yes. Well, if we figured out a way to sell Dr. Fake a profits interest, Dr. Fake would receive sticks, but he would receive less sticks. Yeah. So an actual actual ownership interest has voting rights with it Mm -hmm. and other rights that are superior than just a profits interest. Yeah. So then if you struck a deal... To sell fifteen percent of ownership for seven hundred k, why would someone then still pay seven hundred k for a lesser interest, a profit yeah, interest? That makes total sense because they're not really getting as much. So, all very good, uh, fair points. Thanks for taking me back to law school. Um, let's keep talking about other issues we identified, and the other one was the S corp issue. I know that we've discussed in past shows, but explain what do you mean by an S corp? So. Setting the stage or resetting the stage, when you form a business in any state, there's two primary filings that go with it. Yep. There's the steps you have to take to register with the state that you're in. Right. And then there's the registration to get a tax ID with the IRS. Uh, in California, the state filing is a professional corporation for a dental practice. And then you still have the IRS filing. And when you're a professional corporation, your choices with the IRS are to be taxed as a C corporation or to make an election to be taxed as an S corporation. Yeah, and the important thing to understand here is that an S corp is popular uh, with small, closely held businesses as it allows the the taxes of the corporation to be reported on the personal tax return of the actual owners of that small business. So if theoretically, Brad, someone had a deduction for, I don't know, an airplane, Mm. it shows up on their personal tax return. Exactly. And while a C corporation um, that the professional entity files um, its own tax return, Um, the downside to being a C corporation is often referred to as a double taxation. It can occur when you're trying to – um, meaning the entity itself is going to pay taxes, and whenever there's a distribution of profits, then the owners of that corporation would then also pay taxes. So understand that's where the double tax comes in. So again, the money distributed to the shareholder, that's when taxes are paid, or the entity itself has to pay itself ta- uh, its taxes. So it posed a serious dilemma for the CPA because the whole point of this – entire exercise was to take advantage of the plan deduction and to sell an interest to Dr. Fake. Yeah. So let's explore the original idea for how to do this. The news of the fact that the practice was an S-corp instead of a C-corp actually impacted the original idea. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so the the original plan was for Dr. Pig and Dr. Fake to form an S-corp to own the practice, another pesky rule to qualify for an S-election. If that the if the owners have to be individuals, 
Um, so in this case, um, because it's an S corp, they would have to be um, owners as individuals. And if we would make a, a change in the ownership, the S election would be blown if an entity would come in. It would have to be a C corp. So what could have been done? Um, there would have to have been a decent amount of structure planning from a tax advisor. Um, the two ideas that could, could be explored would be to operate the practice as a C corp and move the airplane expenses to Dr. Pig's new entity. Um, this was um, – I think you said that was part of the original idea, right? But yeah. now, now we need a, the, the tax advisor explaining the impact it's going to be from doing, which is often referred to as an S inversion, where you're going from an S corp to C corp. Yeah, we would have to make sure we do not solve one problem and create other problems. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and that's often the case is you're solving for something and it causes another problem. Another concept to explore when you're converting from an S corp to a partnership um, tax model, um, there are limitations because in, in this case you said that they were in California and with, with the types of partnerships that can be formed for a practice of dentistry is going to be limited, although we do know a general partnership would work. Yeah, and there are planning issues as to the tax impact of converting and to set up an asset protection friendly model with a general partnership. I know we've talked about that mm -hmm. actually in California uh, a few seasons ago. So we could do an entire episode on some of these modeling ideas. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, let's get back to our story. What happened to our friendly Dr. Pig and Dr. Fake? Well, the good news is is that they're still together Yay. and they're still besties. Yes. The bad news is they did not end up doing anything to bring Dr. Fake on as an owner. Hmm. I'm just thankful that the CPA backed off of the phantom equity deal. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, for our audience to understand, just because we dinged the red flag um, when we heard the, the term phantom equity or phantom stock, that for that's not doesn't mean it's illegal or even wrong. But it's important to understand why would a company or a corporation use this option? Um, and if so, other, um, you know, if you are using it, understand the, the why. So because otherwise, as we were talking about, it could cause massive tax or legal structure issues down the road. Michael, um, how about you? Some final thoughts. Well, I, I take these special deductions that we talk about that you know give the ding button. In this case, today, an airplane. So whether you're fu rich and can stand up in the plane or or not, you're mm -hmm. just you're just regular rich. Uh, if you want to try to take advantage of deducting those expenses, you have to be careful that not I mean, first and foremost with your tax advisor yeah. to make sure that the way that the the plane in this case is being utilized qualifies as a business deduction. And then understand, especially in this professional services world, that uh, do, uh, when you have partners and you're wanting to, to deduct things, it's not just the cost of the airplane. It's the risk you're taking with how aggressive you may or may not be being with making the deduction in the first place. So yeah. if the IRS came in and said, you can't be deducting the way you're flying that plane around, yeah. the partner or co-owner of the business would be impacted by yep. that. All good points. Uh, you know, Michael, we'll continue with this season. Next Wednesday, Wednesday show, we'll be discussing red flags, non-binding letter of intent. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.